Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. You know, and wrestler law is is some of those things like you can complain, but it's not necessarily going to change the outcome. And so we kind of try to get to the point where it's like, hey, wrestlers don't complain. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Wrestling Changed My Life. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is the great Mike Mena, four-time state champ, four-time All-American for Iowa, and now he's the head coach at Lindenwood. Really had a great time cutting it up with this legend. Fan of the week goes to Jay Butt. Jay is actually the one who helped organize this interview. He's a wrestling fanatic, and his son Royce is a beast on the IOU circuits. Thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it. Last but not least, folks, if you're going to the Big Tens, we're doing a happy hour on Saturday, March 7th from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Brick House Tavern and Tap. That's Saturday, March 7th. Free beer, merch giveaways, raffles at the Brickhouse Tavern and Tap, 3 to 5 p.m., in between the morning and night sessions at the Big Tens out in Jersey. If you're not going to go to Jersey and want to support the podcast, go to our online store. That's store.wrestlingchangemylife.com. We greatly appreciate any and all support for this wonderful podcast. And thank you all for listening. Let's give it up for Mike Mena. Peace! And we were talking about it off air, but you know, one of the big moments of your... Uh, you know, young career as as a youth was, we were talking. You were in fifth grade. Your brother Bob, who's a four time final, so wrestling Dan Knight, who's been a guest on the show and is a good friend of mine. Uh, I don't think I don't think a lot of people remember how good Dan Knight was, but he was unbelievable. Oh, oh um, my god, he was a beast. <laughs> I mean, and, he would pin everybody. <laughs> he didn't just win; he would pin everybody. Like. That guy, that's that. I mean, he was one of the most dominant high school wrestlers, like in the history, of, like not just Iowa, but probably like all time. You know, no question. I mean, undefeated, didn't even really sniff a loss from what I no. could see. And then at like the junior nationals, he regularly beat the brands. You know, so it's like he was. Yeah. Oh, I know, right? Pound him. Pound him, and I. Pound him. I've had Alan Freed on, and Alan, obviously, a lot of people say he's the best mm-hmm. ever, but I wonder if Alan Freed and Dan Knight ever got together, because that's that same era, you know? Yeah, I think I think Alan's a little too big for him. I okay. mean, you know, he's he's bigger, so. Yeah, Knight he was. He was Knight, probably always a... Knight was, like, telling me he was, like, almost dying to make 118 when he was at Iowa State. Like, so he, yeah, he was small. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was a little smaller than I think Alan Bay of a, a couple weight classes, but um, Alan was like a 34 pounder at that time, you know, uh, with college weights. But, but uh, yeah, yeah, some a lot of great wrestlers out there, man. And, and it's over time, you know, the the, the, um, the um, they just keep coming too. No oh, man, there's so many good. Like we are at the just the best time for wrestling right now. And, mm-hmm. and, I mean, one of the best. There's been a lot of great times. Like, you look back to the 96 Olympic team, how can you say that's not a great team, right? Obviously, that was an awesome team. But right now, we are so deep. There's so many good, so much good wrestling going on right now. Yeah, I like watching it. I'm really enjoying the women's wrestling, too. Yeah. Women's so, wrestling is 
pretty talk, exciting stuff. Talk to us about that, man. So you're at Lindenwood. How did all that come about? Yeah, so so I ended up, uh, um, you know, I was out at Cal Baptist University coaching out there. And, uh, you know, we, we took third in the country and we had a national champ. And then, you know, that was in the NCAA Division Two. Well, then we transitioned to NCAA, NCAA Division One, and we have to sit four years. When you go from D2 to D1, you have to sit four years, so you can't go to NCAAs for four years. Four years? What the hell yeah, is that? So it's just it's the rule that, you know, they're like, you know. It just kills a the program, program, though. They like, their, they like their policies, you know. So, yeah, so I think it just takes time a lot, you know. You know, on a business entity, it just takes time for schools to get their funds in order to be able to operate on a D1 level. Uh, it just takes a lot more money. And so I think that they try to make sure that those departments are ready to go when they do that. And it takes like four years worth of building your funds to do it. So I ended up saying, well, I mean, I'm 46. That means I wouldn't go to the NCAAs until I was 50. And I'm like, no way, man. So I'm like, I'm, so I'm looking for jobs. And then uh, I brought a team out here to Lindenwood a couple of years ago and I was really impressed with the school. I'm like, man, the school is really nice. You know, when you just pull in, it just sparkles. And, uh, uh, and I, and I was just, I was like, when I saw that job, I'm like, you know what? I, I, I could, I could, I, I could work at that school. And then I, and then we stayed at the Drury Inn over at the streets of St. Charles. And it was, I was like, this, this area is like, just immaculate, you know, and it just has everything. I'm like, wow. So we're staying there at the Drury Inn and going to this tournament. And then I'm like, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to live over in that area, you know? So I was thinking all these things and well, that's exactly what happened. So I got the job, and I'm working at that school, and I'm living over there at the streets of St. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I would see. And I was saying it when I went to the tournament. I'm like, yeah, that's something I would do. Because, you know, you, know, you kick up, you know, you cook up your, our ideas in our little fantasy land, you know, like, hey, this would be nice. Oh, this is not, you know, or, or you know, oh, I don't like that. You know, just kind of seeing places as you go and, and go to their campuses, just kind of, you know, evaluate them at that time. Well, I, I, I just, that's exactly what happened. And uh, so I'm like, hey, this is working out. <laughs> Dude, I, I do the same thing, man. I have so much imagination and thoughts going on all the time. I don't, I don't know if it's a wrestler thing or just peop, just athletes or, or whatever, but I'm constantly just in my mind like that thinking, yeah, I could freaking live here. So you did that same thing with Lindenwood. Know. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. And then, uh, yeah, and then it just happened. So mm -hmm. is, is this your first year there? Yeah, yeah, I started August 26th. So it's interesting. I've had – this is uh, interview number 92. and I've Wow. I'm ashamed to say I've only had two women on. Um, well, three. I had Nancy Schultz on a long time ago, but that was to talk about Dave. But um, I had Allie Reagan and Haley Aguello on recently because I'm an Illinois guy. Like, I love Illinois people. And so both of those ladies are you know from Illinois, and they're doing really well right now. And I was, I was kind of learning about – the women's college circuit and how it's the NW or it's the, there's like an organization. What is it? So yeah, it, it, right now it's a, it's a little bit, it, it's a, it's a transition in and of itself as well. So there was the uh, WCWA, which I believe was the women's collegiate wrestling association. Well, now that, uh, that division is, is essentially splitting up into only two divisions because the WCWA was kind of a kind of a club status almost. You know, it was closer to that than than uh, than what they're trying to do today is have there be two national championships, one being NAIA and the other being NCAA. And uh, this year is the first year they're having the women's inaugural NCAA national championships. No shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. Every year it's been the NAIA schools essentially and them all competing in a, in a WCWA, uh, you know, um, national championships. So, uh, so 
Yeah, they're they're really getting so now there's approximately just I think there's like twenty eight or twenty nine and NAI schools and the same exact number for NCAA. And I and they have to get I think they need like one more school to to cause you have to have like I think thirty schools to to have an official. So this year is the inaugural NCAA national championships and by the time the next season rolls around they'll have enough programs to where they'll it'll be like the first NCAA uh women's national championships and ESPN could cover it like official and official 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 because in 2020 women's wrestling is being deemed an NCAA sport god bless that that's amazing I love it yeah yeah so that's that's a big step for women's wrestling, you know, to be to be deemed uh, official. And they're on the emerging sport list right now, but the NCAA will vote on it and they'll sign off on it in August that uh, uh, women's wrestling is an official NCAA sport. Now, that'll help for a lot of schools to continue to add programs at the NCAA level. So that's NCAA Division One, Two, II, and Three. All those schools compete at the women's NCAA Nationals. So there's there's technically only one division in NCAA right now, obviously, for women, and it's going to be Division One because there's only one division, you know? I, I like that. So Are they going to keep it freestyle? Be, yeah, and it's freestyle. So That's now awesome. the women can be a NCAA Division One national champ. That's amazing. Are you guys NAI yeah. or NCAA? We're NCAA. Hell yeah. Okay, cool. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So... You know, um, I knew I knew that that was in the works, and uh, that's was you know that was the direction that that it was going. So, um, I'm I'm really excited about it, and I'm you know it's, it's an honor to be a part of it, and I'm super excited for the girls. Well, who would have thought uh, two Hawkeyes are leading programs? Terry Steiner, obviously leading the the women or the U.S. Team USA, and then you. I mean, I'm sure there's others out there, but I think I just think it's cool that like women's wrestling is so popular it's like if it was like that in the 80s or 90s title nine probably wouldn't have cut so many wrestling programs or like not the title nine cut it but the schools cut it because there wasn't a, a female equivalent but if we would have had this shit 20 30 years ago we'd probably be in a better spot from a men's perspective you're totally right and i think all those schools that that dropped it by by way of title nine they should they should be the first to reinstate like almost immediately fuck yeah like LSU, Clemson, I mean, all these great programs. I mean, the Schultz has started out at UCLA. It's like, how cool would mm -hmm. it be if UCLA had a team? And the, the California has the, the deepest, the most uh, in depth in the United States for women's wrestling. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're, they only have one program out there, Menlo. That's it. Dude, random. So, it's, I mean, in and, a... And, there's so much talent in California. The fact that there's only, I don't know if, about the girls, but for the boys, it's only one division. Like California is, it's not really underrated anymore, but it doesn't get the love that the Midwest states get sometimes, but it is loaded out there. It's loaded. And especially with women's wrestling. Okay. I mean, there should, there should be a hundred, there should be a hundred programs out there with men's and women's wrestling. Absolutely. And at one time there was, you know, at the one time there was, I mean, San Jose State, Long Beach State. I mean, a lot of those schools that UCLA, they all had programs. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, with women's wrestling at the at the collegiate level being deemed an NCAA sport, hopefully that has an impact. I, I mean, how could it not? And I tell you, the other thing that's amazing is I'm a huge UFC fan. I'm sure you enjoy it as well, just being a competitor, but... You know, UFC is the only sport in the world where the women's uh, fights are equally as entertaining as the men's, right? Like women's softball versus baseball, it's really not at the same level. Like women's basketball versus men's basketball, not the same level. But UFC women's is just as popular as the men's. And you think about the biggest feeder sport for the UFC, it's wrestling. So there should be a parallel well, there. And I, I, I just think it's all around great for the sport. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a girl right now that uh, is a pretty good boxer, and she's coming over into wrestling because she wants to wrestle in college. 
but she's her her background is boxing. So I've been having her like show you know show the other girls like how to you know how to do jabs and crosses and hooks and you know like do boxing and and trying to get them to trying to get them to actually add some boxing actually into their wrestling. Cause you know, when you throw your hand, you just check them on the shoulder, you know, or you, or club them in the neck, you know, you just don't hit them in the face, <laughs> you know, but you can still hit them. And I mean, you got to get them out of position. So yeah, I'm like, yeah, you got to throw your hands like boxing. So I'm kind of doing like a little mini, you know, mixed martial art ordeal right now, just because of their background. Absolutely. I mean, think about if you created a little MMA pipeline, you're like, hey, come wrestle here. You're going to be making a couple hundred grand fighting in the UFC. Like, it's a perfect story, you know? <laughs> I, I have this other girl. She's actually on my roster, but she's she's not competing this year because she's a world champion in jiu-jitsu. Wow. And, yeah, she's already a world champ. So, like, she's she's on a – she's, like – defending her title and, and, and at the world level and jujitsu and she's a little bit busy with that right now she doesn't have time to go throw them down because she's competing at the world level right and it's like yeah so i'm like yeah i i do have a, actually a little mini ufc camp over here like these girls all get together and share their disciplines they can have a pretty good little time well and there's some real money in it you know like there's real money oh my god in mma right? real money oh my god yeah. How yeah, do you seriously. compare and contrast coaching men versus women? Um, you know, initially when I started, I, I there was a you know I was obviously I was naturally I was always doing a lot of that compare and contrast, compare and contrast, like, and and then but recently I I've kind of I've started to um started to adopt you know. My, a, a little bit of a, a new, newer philosophy, and it's like once you're a wrestler, you kind of lose your identity. You, you're not a man or a woman. You're a wrestler now. Mm-hmm. And wrestlers have a separate, they got a separate set of law. There's wrestler law. You know, and wrestler law is is some of those things like, you know, you can complain, but it's not necessarily going to change the outcome, you know? And so we kind of try to get to the point where it's like, Hey, wrestlers don't complain. <laughs> you know? Like totally, <laughs> totally like just skyrocket the standard, you know, by way of wrestlers law. This is one of my new theories, by the way, I've been trying to introduce, but I've been thinking about it. Um, but yeah, there's wrestlers law and I'm trying to neutralize the whole gender and just go on wrestlers law. But a lot of times with the guys, you know, you try to get them to do certain things. And then uh, it just seems like the ones that are real struggling, I mean, they're not going to, they're not necessarily going to start doing it or start listening until you kind of show them, you know, by way of wrestling them and kind of put it on them a little bit, you know. You really gotta kind of handle them and say, "Look, this is what we're doing." You know, <laughs> it really with the guys. You know, you really it's some it's not every all of them, but the ones that you're really trying to get on path and you're really trying to get them going. You know, they can do really good for you if you could just get them going. And it's like sometimes you gotta jumpstart them by just wrestling them hard and showing them like, "Hey, wrestling can be that can be this intense." And uh, recently, you know, I'm like, I kind of felt like with the girls, it was getting to that point where I'm trying to get them to wrestle hard, but I wasn't really wrestling them. So it's hard to get them to do it without wrestling them. So I just, so I said, you know what? I'm going to have to wrestle them. (laughs) It's the only way I'm going to have to just put it on them. I got to show them what. So I'm like, so recently I, yeah, I just started wrestling them. And then, and you know what? We started doing, I think a, even a little bit better in some of the weight classes, but um, they 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 really are, you know. I try to keep it. I try to keep it to where just being just being aware of what the females are going through uh, with with their natural courses, but at the same time, 
minimizing any discrepancy between male and female, trying to get it closer to operating on, on wrestling law. Like if you need me to straighten you out, it's, we'll just wrestle and we'll, we'll wrestle it out and we'll, we'll be wrestlers. That's what we are. We'll be that. We'll wrestle. Well, don't you and, think and women are like, like more open to learning than guys too? Sometimes, like they're less stubborn, more open to the learning. It's yeah, they all have their different personalities, and so they all have their own. They all have their their own little style of how they're you know how they operate, their own little mode of function, if you will. And so it just depends, you know. Some of them you can be like, yeah, the, you tell them whatever, and they'll do it right away. And other ones they they want to try all these other things, and then other ones, you know, they're you know in somewhere in the middle and all that. So it's kind of like. I try to get wrestling. I think wrestling life is best in just simple terms, not real, not real complex. You know, you pick them up and put them down, you know, keeping wrestling real simplified, I think is a key to having good wrestling. And so, you know, I know nowadays we get, there's a lot of scrambling and this and that and freestyle is a lot of fun too, but you know, Overall, wrestling is just best if you keep it simple. And and uh, so you know, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get the girls to to have clarity, you know, and simplicity with with things. And um, I think things are going pretty pretty well right now. That's awesome, man. Yeah, clarity of purpose. Uh, I'm a big fan of any really successful coach and Urban Meyer obviously a great coach uh, retired from Ohio state, but he's big on clarity of purpose and just keeping it very simple. Like the defensive backs, they shouldn't be focused on what the running backs are doing. Right. They're, they only focus on their job and keep it real simple. Same thing with, with, with your girls, right? Like focus on what you got to do. Keep it simple, score more points, take them down. <laughs> it sounds crazy, exactly. but wrestling isn't that complex. You know, it, and it's no, it's not. And you know what? I, I weigh about 145, and then the highest weight class for women is 191. So I actually sit at a weight class, and the lowest is 101. So I, I kind of sit right there at the middle. I'm Actually, I compete at 143 in the women's division. <laughs> <laughs> By way of weight classes. Yeah, 141 in the men's and 143 in the women's. And were you that so, light in college when you were wrestling at Iowa? I was a... Uh, well, I would be cutting from I would cut the one eighteen from what I weigh today. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I came in the season at like a one forty one, one forty two, and then I'd cut the one eighteen. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah, I, I was thinking of one twenty six, yeah. but that was only the last year there. That's right. Yeah, and then and then I went up to twenty six, right? Because it was getting kind of old, and and Gable was like, "Hey, we, you know, we want you to go up to twenty six, and I'm like, "Okay." Well, that's a good so, that's a good segue though to like if we if we focus back to to you as an athlete, I mean, all time great Illinois wrestler, four time state champ, the one tie to my boy Joel Stockwell. Got love for Joel Stockwell, but <laughs> I'm uh um I've heard that story that you were in football and that you kind of you came back and you thought you were ready and you weren't, but the reality is every match you got to be ready, right? I'm sure that's what you took from that. Well, and that's why they wrestle the matches. But I'll tell you, um, wh one of the interesting things about that story is that I, I won, what was it, 85 matches, I think. 85 matches in a row. Uh, my freshman and then, and then sophomore year. And then I started my junior year 0-0-1. And so, what I ended up, so then that's like, uh, how the hell was there a tie? Like what happened at the end of the match? There was no overtime at all? Well, it was a dual meet. There was a dual meet. And then, uh, uh, you know, and it was like a Tuesday, like a school night. So they were just like, uh, you know, no, there, there's no overtime. Because that was just a state rule. They're yeah. like, hey, if you run overtime in all these matches, the kid's going to get home at 10 o'clock at night, and it's a school night. <laughs> so, they, so they're like, you, you can't – so, you know, you can just have a tie, you know. Well, the next year in the state of Illinois, they changed that rule. 
that match actually changed it too. Because they were like, hey, we should have wrestled that overtime. So the very next year in the state of Illinois, there was no more overtime. What's like, I mean, how I'm much sorry. I mean, so there was no more uh, ties. There was no more ties. Yeah, no more ties. Well, it's like, how long could it possibly take to wrestle an extra 60 seconds? Like to I mean, out... come on, wrestle the match already. Seriously. So here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the caveat, though, right, and that whole story. And after time of thinking about it. But after winning 85 matches and then having a tie, having the ability to persevere and then win 72 more straight. And that would make the 157. I had to make sure that my math is correct. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's hard to it's hard to bounce back, right? It's not easy. But I think that's a good story that really shows that, hey, if you just persevere, you can win 72 more straight. And rather than, you know, maybe go off the deep end and treat it like it's life and death and, and all this and then blow it all out of proportion. And, you know, what I mean, you know, because you, you know how stories can get real twisty. Oh, you yeah. Know? And, uh, but no, just real simply, you know, when, when, when your matches persevere, have some short term memory and then go and then go on another streak. Exactly. And just don't forget just don't forget who you are. Gable used to say that all the time. Don't forget who you are. Hmm. I uh I'd love to know when was the first time you met Coach Gable? Did he come to the house on a recruiting trip? Was it a phone call? What was that first experience like? Um, yeah, I think so I was actually wrestling I think it was like the central regionals and I think they used to hold it in a Rockford. And he was over there, and the Steiners were wrestling in it, I think, in the college division. And uh, and I was wrestling, you know, I think I was in the high school division at the time. And I, you know, I was like a sophomore, I think. But um, so, you know, as you know, we're we're only ninety minutes from from Iowa City, you know, so it's all kind of in that in that same vicinity. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I was at a tournament with a high school kid, and then. So I'm standing there, I'm talking to Gable, right? And and he doesn't really say a whole lot, right? So, you know, but I really like the brands, you know, the, the, the brands that you, so you like Knight and my brother and the brands, like those were the guys I was like, these guys are great, you know? And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm over there. I'm Gable's there. I'm talking to Gable, but then the brands are there. So then I'm like talking to the brands and the Steiners were there. I'm talking to the Steiners and stuff. And, and I'm just, I'm, so I'm standing there, I'm talking more with the brands and signers than I am with Gable, <laughs> you know, cause I'm like just a kid and, yeah. you know, I'm kind of in all of the brands and the signers, like those guys I've been watching for wrestling for years. And like, you know, the Steiner lace, you know, leg lace, how they tech everybody in like 10 seconds, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> these guys are guy, just leg, leg lace Kings, you know? And so, yeah, so I'm like, I'm talking to Gable, but I don't even know, but I don't, I never saw Gable wrestle. So I really don't know like how dominant he really was, <laughs> you know? So it's like, I was more in all of the brands and the Steiners the first time that I met Gable and was talking to him than actually Gable. <laughs> Make, I mean, I that's, like, that's what you know though. It's like, shit, that's the guys you watched um, the yeah, whole time. True, right? Yep. So I, and, and I was, I go home, I watch films at my, at my parents' house and my daddy, He's got all the tapes and stuff, and he was taping me talk to Gable and the brands and the sign. He has it on tape. Still, the the first meeting, yeah, yeah. Dude, we gotta it's get that good. footage. I'll make a video out of it for this podcast. That's so cool. We gotta. Okay, man. Okay, I'll 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 have to I'll have to get it. But... I gotta get it, man. So did you? I mean, a lot of people don't know, but in Illinois, when it was two divisions. There was some, you know, there was some talk that, you know, single A maybe wasn't up to snuff. And that that's always talk, right? Everyone hears that. And I've had, you know, a lot of my friends wrestled at single A school. So did you have any any doubts that you could do it at the D1 level, like when you were coming up all the way through? Nope. nope. <laughs> Actually, the thought of losing never crossed my mind. Seriously? Yeah, no, honestly, I'm not even being – that. that is – that's not even like a. That's not even being like a smart out. Like that is actually in real, real time. Yeah, the thought of losing never really crossed my mind. You know, I always thought like 
no, I I thought I was going to win the nationals four times. Like I, 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 every time I lost, I was surprised. I was like, what? You had no doubt. No way. No way. Like I was always surprised and it would always be like some close match. And you know, this guy, like, you know, basically I chased him all over trying to get, you know, and, and then he would squeak by. I mean, it was always something like that, you know? Yeah. So it's like, no way. But well, I tell you, man, there's there's a lot of tough guys out there. Just no credit away from them. They just they just were better on that time, you know. And uh, there there's a lot of tough guys. I tell you, <laughs> it's so deep. I mean, people say that the NCAA Division One tournament is the toughest three days in all of college sports, and I believe it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That thing just man. There's there's not a lot of experiences like that, honestly. <laughs> now, if we your, your skin is off your face, it feels like it's just it's weird. Oh, I can't even imagine, man. Now, if we fast forward to your yeah. first uh, first time at Iowa, so you're a four time state champ. You go to Iowa, which mm-hmm. and people got to realize where we grew up in Illinois. El- University of Illinois isn't really relevant. Everyone is a Hawkeye fan where we grew up, even though we're in yeah. Illinois. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. Like, yeah, yeah. Illinois kind of sucked at, for a long time, so. I mean, yep, yeah, they did. Mark Johnson turned it around, and I love Mark Johnson. But for even now, yep. Illinois is like where we're from. It's Hawkeye country. So you went to Iowa, you went to the dynasty. What was your like your first workout or your first moment at at the Iowa wrestling room? Do you remember that? Well, I, I redshirted. You know, Chad Zappel was a starter, and uh, you know, I I just I don't remember exactly like what happened the very first time, but I, when my redshirt year, I was 24 and three. And so, I mean, I did, a, I, I had a pretty decent, a pretty decent year, but you know, there was, there is, I tell you, I, I don't, I'd always saw the brands wrestle. Right. And I, and I saw how ferocious they were, but I did, I had not actually wrestled them. And I had never felt, anything like that ever like it it was like uh, their strength was just it's almost undescribable how strong they are like you can't move them and when they club you they may almost like buckle your legs like you're like oh my god but i just remember wrestling those guys like that's the thing where it was like man i thought i was tough and these guys just rock you. I mean, they pulverize you, you know. And so, yeah, that was some pretty that was some pretty intense wrestling sessions. And they like, the dude. It's funny you say that. I was interviewing, as I mentioned, Tom Ryan. He said that him and Terry got into an argument when they were living together. They went and wrestled for an hour, and the whole time I'm thinking, wait, Terry was 126. Tom Ryan's 158. How is that even possible? But Tom Ryan's like, they'd wrestle anyone, dude. Like they were freaking just animals. Oh, oh yeah animals man and they were the assistants at the time right so yeah so i was i would wrestle those guys but i'll tell you what man i had to take like a leave and ibuprofen before the workout like i would start getting a migraine in the middle of the workout yeah it was almost like you yeah because you know you can't take too many blows at a head like that you know and then you do it for an hour like that i mean you almost have like three concussions in a practice just wrestling them Right, and it's then it's like that's how hard they rock you, just on Ooh. your neck the whole time, man. It's like, oh, holy crap! Yeah, they just pulverize you. Yeah, yeah. What was the and day I in the life like what, when you were training there? Like, what was your daily? Like, would you work out in the morning, at night? What was your routine when you were in the thick of things there at Iowa? So I would, and then Jim Zaleski was the head assistant too. So I worked with the, uh, I wrote, I worked with Coach Zaleski. He, I would drill with him. And then I would drill with uh, Tom or Terry. So get two drills a week in the morning, uh, individual sets. And then the other two days in the morning, I would uh, lift and then snake Carver Hawkeye. And I, I would snake that thing uh, twice, like almost twice, pretty much twice a week. What's you know? that mean? Maybe snake the, the thing. Time, if you got later in competition, maybe I had to back off a little bit. But yeah, every, every week I'd snake it at minimum once. What does that mean to snake Carver Hawkeye? Like run up and down every row? Yep. No yep. freaking way. What? Yep. Well, you run up one row, then you jog across the top, 
and then you jog down, and then you jog over a row, and then you run up that one, then you jog, and once you get to the top, you jog across to the next row, you jog down, you know, you snake it like that. Man. So you won't run up, you won't run up every single row, but you'll be either going down it or up it for sure. And was that something and, where it was like you and a bunch of guys in there? Or is that you by yourself doing that? No, that's, I used to do that alone, you know. Now, Gable would have us do that as a team, you know, periodically. But, you know, guys would do that, you know, and there might be somebody in there snaking it while I, I get started at a different, you know, I, I get in there and they're already in there type of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, I just start. You know, and you might have two or three guys in there at a time snaking that thing, but they're not running together. Right. They're they're, they're snaking it at their own accord and their own pace, and because they probably didn't necessarily start at the same exact second. But uh, you know, that was kind of that was a culture. You know, that was common, even though it sounds uncommon, but that was common, right? So I would do that. So I would lift twice a week in the mornings, and then I'd go snake Carver. And that was, that was the workout, right? And then you come back in the afternoon at 3.30 and then Gable talks and to the team every day he talks, right? Like a little mini lecture. And then, and then you get warmed up and you, and you start the the training as such. What would he say during those pre-practice talks? It was always updating the program. So wherever, you know, wherever we were in the, that point in season, he made sure that he he was clarifying the vision to you, so you could you could work with him on on accomplishing what we're trying to do. And he would go through and he would evaluate each guy, and he'd do these little mini evaluations and mini assessments. And he did you know he did it right out right out in the open. He always provided constructive criticism. He was real good about doing that. He you know he never belittled anybody. You know, and he would say by your weight, right? He wouldn't say minute. He'd be like one eighteen. You got so and so this week, or would he say your name? Yeah, he, you know, he'd be like, you know, and then at eighteen, you know, Mena, you're, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta get into a wrestling match out there. You know, if you get into a wrestling match, he'd pin him. You know, and mm-hmm. that was kind of a common thing he'd he'd tell me. So, but uh. Yeah, so he would say your name. He would, but he would go right up the lineup. He would go right up the lineup, and and then you know, and then he, and he'd be like giving everybody their 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 uh, little mini assessment. And then each talk was probably an average of about, I'd say about maybe twelve minutes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a little longer. Sometimes a little shorter. God, dude, just to be a fly on the wall when the when the master, the great one, is talking to the team would have been a special thing. And you were there for five years, and you know, I don't think people realize, you know, people forget history, right? And I, I've even heard that some youth kids yeah. at tournaments don't even know who Dan Gable is, which to me is heresy. But you know, we're in the era of Penn State right now, like it or love it. I think it's good for wrestling. Mm-hmm. You know, they they've wrestled mm-hmm. with a really fun style. But let's yeah. not forget, dude, that. Between 1991 and 2000, Iowa won 9 of 10, right? So we're yeah. talking about dominance at another level. And then the teams you were on, how many state mm-hmm. champs were on those teams, dude? Like, unbelievable. Between you, Lincoln, and Joe, that is 11 right there. So you figure Ironside, like, do you, do you know, like, the count of how many state titles are on those teams? Well, I mean, but, like uh... – McGinnis and, and and Zadik and 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 uh, Joe and myself. We were all four timers. Lincoln was a five timer. Um, Jeff Jeff McGinnis and, and Zadik. I know they were both undefeated. Joe had one loss. He slammed the kid, and the kid didn't get up. But nobody really beat him. Right, not even close. You know. Yeah. So I mean, it was like. What about Ironside? He had to be a couple Ironside timer. Was a two- he was a two timer, um, but I don't think he got. I don't think he lost his last two years. You know, I mean, there was just a lot of yeah. There was a stack load of talent on that thing, and yeah. uh, a lot of kids that were really used to winning. 
I mean, that's like the dream team. And then even in the upper weights, you know, Lee Fullhart, you know, he beat Kale at the U.S. Open in 2004. He yep. was only a sophomore back then, you know? Yep. Mm-hmm. It's like, yep, geez. yep, yep. And so one of the things I'm keying in on on the documentary is, you know, we hit on some of the stats and some of the great matches like Tom Brands versus Alan Freed and then Pat Smith versus Tom Ryan. But I also focus on some of the softer skills like what made Gable great. And the theme that I'm hearing from the 90s guys is Gable was obviously a master motivator, but he had such a read on every individual on the team and treated people as individuals versus like a blanket team. Would you say that was what you experienced? Yeah, he was an expert at that too. So he was really he was really good at doing that. He was he you know he was on point with all his assessments and and he was fair and he was constructive and uh, but he definitely handled it. He took getting a, getting a group. He handled us as individuals and then got us as a group by coaching us as individuals we would all work together to, to, to accomplish a common objective, but he would address us all individually to be contributors within that common objective. And, uh, and he was very, very masterful with that at, at doing that. And did you think the guys trusted him a lot too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, nobody ever questioned him. I don't really remember anybody questioning him. I mean, in my, in my years, you know, I know, I know there's, there's always struggles with, with, uh, you know, throughout the years and such, but like, cause it's, cause it's just hard, you know, mm-hmm. it's not easy, but, um, but yeah, in, in, in the years that I was there, you like, yeah, nobody, nobody, nobody really, nobody ever questioned him. Whatever he said, I mean, that was, that was law for sure. Well, and especially when you have so many studs, sometimes the egos can get in the way, but it just shows that people bought into Gable and the more you trust someone, the more you're willing to do it for him. And what I love about Gable is he developed guys. Like guys got better when they got there. They weren't just high school studs and they stayed high school studs. People got better. Like Daryl Weber, I was talking to him before this. He definitely got better during his five years there. Like he was not like his retro freshman year. He didn't even qualify. Then he goes on to be a t- three-time All-American NCAA champ, you know? So it's like he de- – yep, I love absolutely. that when you see development going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and there, and Mike Uecker too. You know, Mike Uecker was a two-time All-American. He never won a state title. There's guys in there, man. There's guys in there that were, you know, also too that were, uh, you know, guys that stepped up and, and contributed in huge roles. Just look at Jesse Whitmer. He never started in any – steps in and wins a national title i know i told myself i wasn't going to ask you about that because i'm sure everyone in the world asks you about that in an interview and i try to get some original content but of course it comes up so let's let's talk about that a little bit so you you come into iowa you're one of the only four-time all-americans in in program history and you know 94 iowa gets second to oklahoma state and so there's got to be some tension there 95 96 you guys win going into 97 and, you know, the 97 season's been told over in a book, season on the mat. It's been told over in a documentary. But we wouldn't be doing ourselves justice if we didn't talk about the 97 season because it's, like, unbelievable. So at what? So you're coming into the 97 season. Let's say it's, like, September or August. What weight do you think you're going to go at that point in the year? I think I'm going 18. Okay. That, that's, what I, that's what I thought. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. And then – Gable is, you know, he's analyzing the guys and he's, you know, he's concocting, you know, all his Gable plans, you know, <laughs> and he can kind of see, he's like, we need to bump men up and we'll be, we'll be a better team. So he, we have a morning practice, ironically, one time in Carver, we're Snake and Carver, right? But this time we're doing it as a team. What time of year is this? And this is, this is like in December, I want to say like. It was it, it was it was it was first semester. And had Either, you already made one eighteen for a duel, or you hadn't got down yet? I think I was. I don't. I don't think I. I don't think I wrestled eighteen there. I. I think I was. We might have been. This might have been like late November, and we were getting started, and we were going to wrestle Iowa State. I might even wrestle a couple early duels, even at 26. Gable was like thinking, "Up, this is what he's going to do." 
I think uh, I think I started the season at 26, and then I'm thinking in my mind I'm going down to 18, and then uh, and I wrestle up and I and I beat Dwight Henson, mm-hmm. and 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 he was like number one at 126 at the time, and Gabe was like. You know, he's thinking, gee, just beat the number one ranked guy. Of course he's going up. He's staying up. He ain't going down. You know, and I'm thinking I'm going down. Well, because Gable had bumped me up at other times in my career. That wasn't the first time that he bumped he bumped me up. He bumped in previous years even he would bump me up to 26 and I I would beat the guys. You know, and that would be weighing in at 18. <laughs> he did that with a lot of guys. I mean, think about when he asked Lincoln or Troy Steiner to go down to 34 when he was in the right? champ at 42. It's like fuck. <laughs> Like, dude. I know. I was like, what? Were you there when that happened or not yet? Yeah, that was 93. I was redshirt in that year. Dude, how epic was that? And then when Gable did the mock duels after Lincoln lost his first one, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. I know, right? And then you know, and then he comes out and he was this Paul Andriotti from Northwestern. I was like, oh, my God. He got beat by this guy. But he, he came back and won at 16-15 against Jerry Avis. One of the best matches but, ever. Um, oh, it was huge. It was great. It's yeah, so, so still one of my favorite matches to watch. And the Marinetti match is one of my favorites, too. I love that match. I mean, not not. I mean, not I mean, if you're a Lincoln fan, but it was just good wrestling. You know, <laughs> a lot of scoring. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, right. So, sure. So take us back to 97. It's a, it's call it late November. It's a morning workout. What happens then? Yeah. So he, he says, Mena, hey, you want to go out for breakfast? And I'm like, yeah, sure, coach. He's like, okay, let's go to the village gym. I'm like, all right, yeah, let's go to Village Gym. I had no idea what we were gonna, why we were going out for breakfast. It just was just seem. I'm just gonna, you know, you just do what he says, you know. So I'm like, yeah, we're going out for breakfast. So we go out for breakfast, and and he's, we, you know, getting before we order the food. He's he's he brings up a conversation. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, he's like, I'd like to ask you to do something. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, coach. He's like, I want you to stay up at 26. And I'm thinking, well, I'm like, if that's what you need me to do, I, I can do it. And, like, I was thinking about, you know, wrestling 18, but I'm like, is that what you want me to do? And he goes, well, you know, make a better team and, you know, we kind of need you there. And he's like, I I just was just wanted to ask and see if you'd be willing to do it. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I'll I'll win it anyway, you know. As as, as any it. as any guy could be thinking, you know, like you put me in heavyweight, I'll win at heavyweight. <laughs> I mean, that's just how guys like that think. I mean, think they're Godzilla, you know. They're like, yeah, I'll get whatever heavyweight class. So yeah, I'm just like, sure, you know. Then I order like the pancake, the omelet, this toast, and I order like three times the amount of food after that. But you know, <laughs> you, you know, then, yeah. Then the waitress comes and I like triple the order. But, uh, you know, Jesse, uh, we, Jesse and I used to wrestle off and, you know, he, he never beat me in any of the matches. So Gable knew like I could have a wrestle off, but Whitmer's not going to beat him. And then I'm not going to get my way. <laughs> right. you know? So, so he's like, I'll just ask him. And, you know, he was real civil like that. He could just sit down and have a conversation with you. And I'm like, yeah, you know, of course I think I'm going to win no matter what, you know? So. Um, that that's exactly how it went. Had you gone out to breakfast, or like was that common for him to go out to to lunch or breakfast or dinner with the guys? Well, it, it, you know, he he would, you know, we would go over to his house, and you know, you know, his wife Kathy would make food, and you know, we we were a pretty close team, so you know, I didn't think anything of it. I just, you know, and 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 also Lincoln, Joe, and myself were the three captains of the '97 team. So I'm just thinking, you know, we're going to go, you know, have some cap and talk, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, I don't, I don't really know, but I'm just like, sure, you know, whatever you need. And, That's... and, and then, you know, you don't really question him when he, when he asks you or tells you, you just, you just kind of like, yeah, you know, this is what I'm here to do. So nothing's more important than this, you know? That's the kind of loyalty he commanded though, because like one, you knew that he was living the life himself. Like all he cared about was wrestling and all he cared about was his guys, but it's like, man, when when the guy asks you to do something, people just did it. It's like unbelievable. Yeah, it. I mean, even Troy Steiner, when I interviewed him, he's like, I'd still do it again today. Like, I wouldn't think twice Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. Matter of fact, he he called Lindenwood for me, 
and he put he put a call in for me to help me get this job, you know, and because uh, he's a he's a refer, you know, he's one of my references, you know, so I keep him up to date on what I'm doing so he can talk on my behalf, you know, I mean, and that's even today, even for the current job I have. So, like, absolutely. If he if he told me, hey, man, I need you to come back to Iowa and, and be the head women's coach over here, I, I'd be packing my stuff to go to Iowa. Yeah. What's like, would you say he's one of the most important figures you've had in your life? Oh, absolutely. For sure. I mean, how could it not be, right? I mean, it's like, God, each, and like what I love about him is that kind of like John Wooden, you know, I, I relate Gable to John Wooden a lot. He was like a people's person. Yep, I was person. reading Wooden this morning, actually. Dude, do you have the, is it the blue book on um, life lessons or something like that? I have it in my office. Yep, here. I got, I got them all. I got them. I had it on an ebook. I got them all printed out and in a binder. And I, I was just actually reading. Love that book, dude. That's I got onto that book because Pete Carroll. You know, he talks about before Pete Carroll got to USC in two thousand two, he was an average coach. He'd been fired a bunch. He took a. He got fired by the Patriots. He took a year off, and on that off year, he didn't work, and he read this wooden book, and it changed his life. And he says that's how he got the philosophy and the plan to go and win at USC and then now at the Seahawks. So like I heard that. I'm like, I'm ordering that book. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, He's amazing too. Oh yeah. Unbelievable, dude. Mm-hmm. But um mm-hmm. but to your to your point that like Gable's like a people person though. He's not a robot at all. Like he is like a master at human relationships. He totally is. He's very good at arbitration too. Yep, he's very good at it, and and he's so super authentic, and you know, and he's got those deep rooted, you know, state of Iowa, homegrown, you know, hard work and discipline, commitment and dedication, values. Like, I mean, that's just the salt of the earth, you know, philosophy too. So, you know, his content as well as his character is like just profound. Yeah. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour. Do you have maybe 10, 15 more minutes? Sure. All right, cool. A couple of things I want to ask you about relative to the documentary. So you talk about, you know, you were one of the captains. Talk about Lincoln McRaven and Joe Williams. Like, what kind of impact did they have on the room? How freaking good were they? Because, again, both Olympians, oh like, unbelievable, right? Yeah, those guys are amazing. I mean, they were just so dominant. But what was kind of unique about it is, both were, uh, 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 they were a man of very few words. I mean, between the both of them, they'll say like three words. I mean, Lincoln doesn't say anything. He, <laughs> and even when he does talk, you can barely hear him. He's like almost whispering. And Joe just says less than that. <laughs> he doesn't say nothing. <laughs> it is like, I mean, he's like on mute, you know? Who was and, Joe uh, Buddies yeah. with on the team? I can never figure this out. Who were his guys? Uh, Lincoln and myself and uh, um, uh, I think Lee Fullheart quite a bit because Lee was kind of mute. He didn't say anything. So, you know, you sit around a round table which with Lee Fullheart and Joe Williams and Lincoln McRaby. You're you're not gonna have a whole lot of conversation. <laughs> no talk, man. So it's like they're just oh. they're silent, man. They are silent until they get on the mat. Then they're violent. You're like, wow. Then they'll hurt somebody. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of real unique. This is how how good they are, but they don't they don't say anything. So like I was the only guy. Of course, you know the little guys. They always chirping, you know. Yeah. And uh, all barking, you know. So it's like. I would be the guy that would probably be the most vocal of like the three of us, you know, and of course I say enough for all three of us. So it's like, yeah, you know, I would do, I would be the one if there, you know, if there was something to be said, like I would usually be the one to say, say it out loud, you know, who was the, uh, <laughs> who was the ladies man on the team? If there was one, the ladies man. Yeah. Was there a ladies man on the team back then? Uh, Seemed like, seemed like I, seemed, you know, Ironside was pretty. He seemed like Ironside got a, he got kind of a lot of attention, but Ironside was pretty. He was pretty mild too with his personality. Actually, he don't say a whole lot either. I was gonna I say, mean, like, man, everyone was a pretty lot of these quiet. Guys, I know, man. These guys are a quiet group, man. They can, they sure know how to fight, but they're they're a quiet group. Um, you know, Lincoln was married, 
you know, so like, uh, you know, Joe, Joe, Joe was, you know, he was a pretty, pretty good ladies man, but, but was <laughs> now when the girls are around, he kind of open up a little bit. The girls would be around, he'd get a little bit more, uh, colorful, you know, but, uh, you know, cracking jokes and stuff like that. But uh, if it wasn't, if they weren't around, he wasn't saying a whole lot, but, you know, pro- probably Joe actually, pro- probably Joe, just because of that, that piece, because he was kind of quiet and he was real reserved until they got around. Then he was kind of funny. Kind of. He's also there. like a Greek God though. It's like the ladies had to love Joe Williams, man. He's like a specimen, yeah, 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 yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And he, and he just is like, yeah, exactly. He's just, you know, he's all chiseled up. Like you're like, my Lord. Well, it's like, you know, it looks like Hercules. the reason I ask is I compare and contrast the eighties teams with the nineties teams. You know, the the theme for me in the 80s is work hard, play hard. Like, those guys were wild animals, dude. Like, Roy Salger's yeah. living in a tent in the dorms. It's freaking <laughs> chaos, right? Whereas yeah, the, the 90s, I call that the new era, where it's the Steiners didn't drink, the Brains didn't drink. It's it's all business, dude. And the guys were just – and the results reflected that, you know? So I just think it's so interesting that – Gable was able to come back from the slump and then get right back on top again. You know, it's unbelievable Absolutely. to me. Um, Absolutely. Second thing I want to ask you about was after the Big Tens in 97, you guys won, but Gable says it wasn't a great tournament. And like, on the bus ride back, he even says he kind of was panicking a little bit in his mind. Like, how is he going to get the guys ready for the Nationals? Because Oklahoma State, you guys had lost to Okie State. I'm sure they mm-hmm. dominated the Big 12s. And, yep. you know, so like on the bus ride back from the Big Tens, he's kind of panicking in his mind. And he's like, all right, everybody, get here early on Monday. We're going to work out hard. And you guys had that Monday morning workout. Looked like it was pretty hard. And then Gable tells me, he's like, after that workout, I see someone sitting on the wall, like really tired. It's Mark Ironside. And Ironside tells Gable, he's like, coach, we are burnt. We're spent. Like, we're exhausted. Yeah. And so Ga- mm-hmm. Gable, like, you know, kind of says, all right let me self-reflect here. He said he didn't sleep at all that night because when someone like Ironside says you're tired, you know you're in trouble. Like, what are the rest of the guys yeah. feeling right, you know? Yeah, and, yeah um, he, don't, he don't get tired. Exactly. And so, nor would he ever, like, I can't even imagine Ironside complaining or, like, saying that. So the fact that he said that just shows that everyone was pretty well burnt. So Gable notoriously kind of backs off the team and focuses on the mental side versus the work part. Do you remember yep. it that way? Like, does is that story kind of sound familiar? Oh, yeah. Backing off. What what happened there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gable, Gable, he did he did some magical stuff, man. He was he would do these twenty second goes, and you know, you he would break a match down into twenty seconds, and then you had to score within the twenty seconds. You know, but so, so even some of those were starting to get a little watered down. So he started tapering it even more so. And uh, really started just doing a lot more, you know, mental work with us. We used to do these Russian saunas where you would get in the sauna for like 30 minutes. And then you get out, you walk through a cold shower, hot shower. Then you wrap up in these sheets and you go out in the restroom. You drink this hot tea, you know, and, and then he would he would kind of walk around and just talk to you and, and just kind of dial your mind in. And and just get everybody dialed in, man. Get everybody dialed in one by one. You know, he was doing a lot of stuff like that, and it was just just really trying to get us recovered and get our minds dialed into what we needed to do. And and then uh, is that when you guys would do the sauna, then big put the sheets on and lay around on the mats in the sheets? Yeah, and drink hot tea. They called it a Russian sauna. <laughs> Dude, yeah. you're still a big sauna guy, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I still I still sauna regularly, for sure. I had to, man. My 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 joints and stuff start hurting, you know. Yeah, but I, I've heard you say that it's like it keeps you young, man. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. The sauna is definitely the fountain of youth. It's really good for your skin too. It make it keeps you it keeps the wrinkles away, it makes your skin real tight. Because after after your pores tighten up, well, your skin goes with that pore, so it, like it all gets real tight. Dude. And uh, yeah, definitely is a fountain to use for sure. I just turned thirty this year. I'm starting to see a little wrinkle in myself, so I might I might buy a sauna today after that talk. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And all it takes is just uh, you know one good twenty minute go, and you'll see after you like you shower up and your, your body cools down, you have some water, you'll see it. 
it, it, it's your skin will get real tight, and that's was, that's how you do it. Man, I'll uh, I'll take you up on that. And then, uh, Mike, last question for you, man. And first of all, just thank you for your time today. I, I love hearing about these stories, and it's even it's even cooler for me since you're an Illinois guy. And those those Iowa teams had two Illinois legends on there, so that's that's just awesome to me. Um, but if you look back on how wrestling changed your life, or even how Dan Gable changed your life, you know, like what would you say? Like, how is how is the sport or how has Coach Gable impacted you over all these years? You know, man, he's he said a lot of stuff. It's hard to pin it down to, you know, one area, but you know, there there's some there's some key things and one of the key things is he'd always say is always keep improving, you know. And even in our professions and our adult lives and all the other elements of our lives, like that's something that that is definitely transferable in every category. Just always keep improving, right? So, and then the other thing was, is, you know, in order to accomplish that, when adversity comes, there's only two options. Either you overcome it or it overcomes you. Yep. I would say those two principles will, will be things that I'll definitely, I definitely apply today and I'll definitely continue to apply because they're universal principles, you know? So, uh, but, but he said a lot of stuff, but it kind of comes down into, you know, just hard to put Gable in two, two categories, two, or two sentences, like, you know, but, but I think it's, a, you know, from my perspective, cause I wrestled in the Hawkeye wrestling club for three years after college and Gable became the Hawkeye wrestling coach. So I ended up wrestling for him for like eight years and, oh, and, and right. it, it kind of came yeah, yeah, he was a Hawkeye wrestling coach because he retired in 97 with his last year. But I think that, uh, you know, even considering post-college and international style, you know, it, it kind of came down to that. You know, it's always keep improving and and just when adversity comes your way, you know, there's only two options. Either you overcome it or it overcomes you. So you, you overcome it and that's it. And then you can keep improving. And that, that really is kind of really basic stuff. But... But yeah. how much easier or how much better would your life be if every time something like that happened, you chose to get better and overcome it? Like, it's very simple, but if you just did that, how much better would everyone's lives be, you know? That's why he's always said, you know, America needs wrestling. Hell yeah. America needs wrestling. And, um, you know, after after wrestling, life is a little bit easier. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a review, give us a rating, and share this with your friends. It would mean the world to us. Thanks for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life. Sing 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 to Wrestling Changed My Life.